I'm going to talk a little bit tonight about a, a book of mine, but, it's, but I'm going to try to make it a little more interesting than that sounds. Some of you may know that some time ago I, I had a book called uh, The Politically Incorrect Guide to American History, and nobody really seemed to notice it. It never really amounted to much. <laughs> oh, wait. No, 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 no. The subject of furious debate and attack, but rather than just come to the conclusion that maybe I should just avoid American history in the future, I thought, you know, on the other hand, I did sell a lot of copies, so might as well, you know, do what works. <laughs> so, so the new one, I mean, really hot off the presses, you know, is, is this one. It's 33 questions about American history you're not supposed to ask. And you see, see Uncle Sam on the cover? And he's saying, shh, don't you ask these questions. So we'll ask a few of them tonight, particularly the, the ones that are sort of economically oriented. <clears throat> Now, I'm going to start with a little story, and the relevance of it may not be obvious, but it is, it, there is, it is, it is relevant. And in fact, it so eerily parallels the story I will follow it with that I think you'll see why, why it's so useful to begin in this way. Some of you may already be familiar with H.L. Mencken's work on the subject of the bathtub, and to those people, I apologize. However, some of you, no doubt, uh, will be hearing this for the first time. In 1917, H.L. Mencken, who, of course, one of the great, uh, great social critics and just a uh, great writer, if you can write one one-hundredth as well as Mencken, you know, you're, you're, you've really got something. Mencken decided in 1917 that it was an unbelievable shame that here it was, the 75th anniversary of the invention of the bathtub, and yet no sector of society had, had any official commemoration of this event. So he was going to rectify this terrible injustice and take this opportunity to recall a bit of the history of the bathtub. So he proceeds along these lines and tells us that the bathtub was invented in Ohio in the 1840s by a gentleman named Adam Thompson who decided that it would be helpful, if, not only for the purpose of bathing would it be nice to have a, something to sit in, but it would be also helpful if you could discard the water by means of a system of pipes and then also fill the bathtub through a system of pipes. Now, according to Mencken, the bathtub began as rather a puny thing, really just a more of a glorified dishpan, you might say. And it required the work of a servant to bring, laboriously, to bring the water up to the bathtub and dump it out and then go get more water and bring it. And when Adam Thompson took the first bath in the first bathtub, it was the talk of the town. Apparently people were all over his bathroom saying, this is one heck of an invention. <laughs> and they went around astonished, such that even the medical profession decided to weigh in on the subject, normally very reticent to the medical profession, but, never, but they decided that, in fact, this could turn out to be a health hazard, the, the bathtub. <laughs> and so, and in fact, other people criticized it as, as really a kind of a, of a luxury, the kind of luxury that might undermine the Republican simplicity of American society. You, know, you can't really be good Spartans if you have bathtubs and sort of girly things like that. So this sort of criticism began to be heard. However, as usual, the President of the United States led the way, and when Millard Fillmore, some of you may not know, particularly Europeans, that he actually was a U.S. President, Millard Fillmore installed the first bathtub in the White House and a lot of the popular opposition to this new invention began to melt away. Hey, the president's doing it. How could it possibly be wrong? <laughs> now, the, the major problem with Mencken's history of the bathtub was that he made the whole thing up. None of that's true. And, and in fact, he finally confessed years later. He said, I have no idea where the bathtub came from. I don't know who invented it. I don't know who... Millard Fillmore was not the first president to introduce the bathtub. I mean, how, how was Thomas Jefferson getting clean, you know, you might wonder. So, so you might wonder, well, why did he do this? You know, well, for one thing, to amuse himself. It was sort of interesting to see what he could get away with. How gullible is the population? Because he peppered his account of the bathtub with, for instance, citations of very impressive and professional-sounding periodicals like the Western Medical Quarterly. There was no Western medical quarter. <laughs> but people just ate this up and, and so on. And partly what he was showing was that 
the popular mind is easily captivated by stories like this that are, that are interesting and that are told in an authoritative tone with professional sounding citations. And he noted that, for example, look at all the propaganda people bought during World War I. And he said, a lot of people still believe these things and they were entirely made up and people who made them up don't even defend them anymore and people continue to believe them. So he used this as sort of an object lesson. But it's also worth noting what ended up happening with this sort of what he called this burlesque history of the bathtub during Mencken's own lifetime. He said, I began to get letters from people seeking to help corroborate my facts. Well, these aren't facts. I made them up. How can you corroborate them? Why are you writing to me? <laughs> or, he, he said he began hearing these, uh, these so-called facts cited in magazines and newspapers, on the floor of Congress, he would hear his rendition of the bathtub cited, and even he began to see it popping up in official reference works, including encyclopedias. <laughs> so he began to think, what, what, what have I done? <laughs> How do I undo this? But there is, of course, a, again, there's an important lesson in all this, and he says that this is, this is not a, an interesting anecdote because it is singular. It is interesting because it is so typical. And incidentally, a recent history of the presidents repeated the Millard Fillmore as first bathtub user myth. So it, it still won't go away. That is still part of presidential folklore. Unbelievable. I mean, that Millard Fillmore, I'm sure when he was alive, had no idea that that's the only thing anyone would know about him. He bathed. That's what we can say about this man. Now, bear this example in mind as we move forward to another one. And by the way, in case you're thinking, where is the scholarly merit in this lecture? Remember, this is the informal, we're all sitting cross-legged sort of <laughs> lecture. Then we have the other more serious ones later in the week. <coughs> you understand. Well, I, wanna, I want to compare this to another episode that's much more recent. Now, this episode involves a speech that I referred to in an article for Mises.org a couple of weeks ago now, I think. And even if you read that article, there's, there's a lot of new stuff here that I think will hold your attention. And this is a speech that was delivered around the year 1854 by an Indian chief in the Pacific Northwest named Chief Seattle. Now, if you were to read Al Gore's book from the early 1990s, Earth in the Balance, you will find that he quotes Chief Seattle at length. No, that wasn't a joke, actually. <laughs> Because in the speech, Chief Seattle is supposedly saying that his people consider every living thing, including every last pine needle, every bug, everything in the world to be in some way sacred. And there in Earth in the Balance, you can almost hear Al Gore off in the corner applauding approvingly for Chief Seattle. Well, it turns out that this speech by Chief Seattle is a complete fabrication. It was invented not in 1854, when, by the way, Chief Seattle really did give a speech, more about that in a minute, but it actually was written in the early 1970s by a Texas screenwriter named Ted Perry, which is not a very Indian-sounding name, you'll notice. <laughs> now, I'll say more about poor Ted Perry in a moment, although for now I do want to point out to you that to his credit, Ted Perry has tried going around the country telling people, listen, I made this speech up. <laughs> You can all stop quoting it now. And it, it began to be, it was just quoted and quoted and quoted and quoted. Now, there are obvious anachronisms in the speech. I mean, he, the, so obvious, he may as well have been saying, you know, our, our tribal website is www. <laughs> like, there's no reason somebody should fall for this speech. He's talking about railroads at a time when the railroads weren't going to be in his part of the country for another 20 years or he's talking about buffalo, when there were no buffalo for hundreds of miles uh, from where he was, and just on and on, but supposedly he's talking about uh, white people in, uh, riding by in railroad cars, shooting buffalo, and then riding away. These are the dumbest white people in the world. <laughs> so anyway, the speech goes up. But interestingly, though, in the Al Gore book, he takes out the stuff about the buffalo because he knows that no one would believe that. So isn't that interesting? So he has to know this is phony. It's not like, oh, well, you know, Everyone told us there were weapons of mass destruction, and how could I know that they weren't there? I mean, he had to know this, right? It's sort of obvious. Okay, well, what's interesting, though, is that not only did this persist, even after, in the 1980s, 
and by the way, yes, it took until the 1980s for this to be authoritatively debunked by serious scholars saying that it is impossible, this speech is absolutely made up. Uh, by the 1990s, you were getting a, a children's book written on this subject. And, and, I, and again, I will return to what did Chief Seattle really say? But he certainly did not give an environmentalist speech. That is absolutely certain. And, and, and any serious scholar acknowledges that. But in the early 1990s, we got a children's book based on Ted Perry's speech. And it was called uh, Brother Eagle, Sister Sky by Susan Jeffers. And so they're using the, the Ted Perry speech, which is, again, it's total fabrication. And they're illustrating it with, by the way, again, perfectly absurd illustrations throughout the book with anachronistic images and images of things that couldn't possibly have been in the Pacific Northwest. But that doesn't matter because it sold 400,000 copies within several years. It was a New York Times bestseller for 17 weeks. It reached number five. Well, it was, you know, again, people pointed out, remember in the 80s we debunked this speech and we've got this best-selling children's book now based on it. So the New York Times, which is very, very sensitive about correcting errors, that was a joke, by the way, <laughs> decided that they would remove Brother Eagle, Sister Sky from the, the nonfiction list and they instead put it in the advice, how-to, and miscellaneous category. <laughs> Well, the sales kept going. It's now sold uh, over a half million copies. There's been no attempt to correct any subsequent printing. Now, poor Ted Perry. I, I want to return to him because he now has to live with this. And he has to live with this children's book that basically is quoting him. And by the way, the reason that people, one of the reasons people uh, latched onto this was partly because it serves a certain ideological purpose, but also because Perry had written this, in effect, phony version of the speech for a documentary on pollution that he'd been commissioned to, uh, to produce. And at the end, he had, in, in, he had intended for it to say, written, including the cheap Seattle speech, written by Ted Perry. But when it actually came out, it said, researched by Ted Perry. So it gave the impression that he had laboriously dug through all the records and found this speech. But actually, he had written the speech. And he went and complained to, to the production people and said, well, this is a complete, uh, you know, this, this, uh, misrepresents exactly what I did. And they said, well, we thought it would work better if it said researched. And that was it. So ever since then, you just can't get away from this speech. William O. Douglas, the Supreme Court Justice, quoted from it in his autobiography. Because the speech was delivered in 1854, people said to themselves, let's see, who would have been president in 1854? Franklin Pierce, also a bathing president. <laughs> So it suddenly became described as a letter to Franklin Pierce. It began appearing in magazines as a letter from Chief Seattle to, uh, to uh, Franklin Pierce. We began, for example, in England, we heard the United Society for the Propagation of the Gospel reproducing the speech on tape. And one figure from the United Society for the Propagation of the Gospel even described the speech as, quote, a fifth gospel almost. Hmm. So we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Ted. <laughs> Ted is the fifth gospel. Now then, the, the Perry speech is excerpted and, and, and appears in, in uh, other countries now throughout Europe. So all you Europeans thinking, oh, you gullible Americans. Well, come on, now you people are a close second because I have here uh, in, 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 uh, in alphabetical order, so I'm not singling anybody out, Denmark, uh, Germany, Holland, Italy, Portugal, and Sweden all broadcast this phony thing. So it kept going on and on. So it's true that as of the 80s it had been debunked, but like anyone cares, it just keeps going. It serves the purpose of people who are, you know, radical environmentalists so they can use Chief Seattle as a bludgeon to bash everybody over the head with. So poor Ted Perry, his own son, or sitting around a summer campfire, here's the, here's the Chief Seattle speech being read to him. <laughs> and then one day, Ted Perry is sitting in church and they're having this special children's function where children go up to the pulpit and say something that is meaningful to them. And one of them gets up there and of all the speeches on earth he could have quoted from, it's the Ted Perry Chief Seattle speech. And there's Ted Perry sitting in his pew saying, I am never going to get away from this thing as long as I live. <laughs> Now, in incidentally, he brought to the attention of Susan Jeffers, author of the children's book, that in fact, you're not really quoting Chief Seattle. You're really quoting me. Now, her, her response to this was to say, 
Ted Perry can say he wrote these words. I can't say that he wrote them because I don't know. <laughs> Susan Jeffers became a millionaire because of this book. She doesn't want to know. <laughs> well, we, we could go on with examples. Uh, on Earth Day 1992, 6,500 religious leaders received copies of this speech in the mail from the Earth Day USA organization. It just goes on and on and on. We have uh, Theodore Rozak in his book, uh, Voice of the Earth, refers to the Ted Perry version. He says, well, it is apocryphal, but he says, quote, what we have here is a piece of folklore in the making. Well, we have a piece of something in the making. <laughs> now, a lot of that comes from an article from 1993 from the Reader's Digest, but, I'm sh but the thing is still, the book is still selling, people still buy into it. Now, I think the connection to the bathtub should be clear enough. You know, I mean, here, here's poor Ted Perry as the modern-day H.L. Mencken trying to run around and correct people. Although Mencken, being the cynic that he was, I think rather enjoyed watching people make fools of themselves. <laughs> so I wrote this piece uh, on, on Mises Org, and, it's, and it appears at, at, at uh, much greater length in my 33 questions. Because I wanted to get to the bottom of this question about the American Indians and whether or not they were environmentalists. Now, I do use the term American Indians not because I'm just gratuitously politically incorrect. I don't know where people would get that idea. But, <laughs> but rather because it's actually a more specific term than Native American, because a Native American would include people from Alaska and Guam, for instance, which would not be included in the term American Indian. But in any event, I was interested in this subject. What was their real record with regard to the environment? And what did Chief Seattle really say? Now, the best that... Indian scholars are able to reconstruct his remarks, pretty much he was saying something like the following, that we are about to sell some of our land to the whites, and our ancestors are buried in it. We want to make sure that we're going to have the right to come visit them, and this land is sacred to us because our ancestors are buried in it. He was not saying that all land everywhere is necessarily sacred to us because land as an abstract concept is sacred to, to, to his people. That was not his point. He was making a much more limited uh, and, and sort of finite point uh, than, than that. So what was, the, what was their record like? And the answer was that, well, they were human beings, so their record was mixed. They were not cutesy little cardboard cutouts or mannequins that you can use, again, as bludgeons against American society. They were actual human beings. And in fact, some of them are kind, even today are rather insulted that they're being, they're being hauled into the service of left-wing political ideologies and not really being treated with respect or no one really cares about the differences between the various tribes. We just know you were great environmentalists and we don't like those smokestacks over there, so that's the end of the story. Now, in fact, it's true that they, in some ways, were poor stewards of the environment. In some cases, they, they engaged in slash-and-burn agriculture, they would light fires that would get completely out of control and in some cases wiped out animal populations. They nearly wiped out animal populations through hunt, over hunting because of the belief that some of them had that if you were to kill an animal in a hunt, you should not reproach yourself for this because the animal will be reanimated in larger numbers. Well, obviously, that doesn't happen. So if you, if you do just keep hunting like that, you're going to almost uh, wipe, wipe everything out. And, they, and uh, the white-tailed deer was almost wiped out because of that. But at the same time, I'm making, a, I think, a more interesting point than just the kind of limited Rush Limbaugh sort of point that uh, the Indians were savages and therefore we shouldn't pay any attention to them. To the contrary, I'm trying to suggest that actually what they did do right is precisely the part of their history nobody pays any attention to and that deserves to be mentioned. And that when they were good at being stewards of the environment and of animal species, how did they do it? Through wh what mechanism did they use? Well, it turns out, by and large, they used what we would recognize as property rights, which supposedly they knew nothing about, which again is a ridiculous generalization that, that, uh, that cannot be sustained. But they allocated hunting and fishing rights to various family and clan organizations in such a way as to prevent overhunting or overfishing. Because if this family is responsible or has, has control over hunting in this particular area, well then naturally they have an interest in not killing every single animal there because they have an eye to the future. They need to preserve some. Whereas if they have no exclusive control of this area, but they, but they think we better not kill all the animals because then what will we do next year? What's to stop some, some person who doesn't have much foresight, has very high time preference, let's say, and just, just shows up and just starts killing and just 
firing his gun everywhere and killing them all. There's nothing to stop that. There's no way to stop that. So the incentive is just for everybody to just kill quickly, take everything, and not think for the future. But in allocating these rights, you have here provision for the future. And you have an incentive to prevent people who are antisocial and anti-conservationists from coming onto your property and killing out the animals that you need for the future. In fact, when it came to salmon, uh, Robert Higgs has written an, uh, an important article on this in the early 1980s. The Indians, again, likewise, established uh, fishing rights and would say, okay, so this area, you fish here. And so, again, you don't want to fish and, and get rid of all the salmon. And when the whites took over uh, salmon, uh, the, uh, when they would catch salmon in the Pacific Northwest, they, they typically did not learn this Indian lesson. And you had, in effect, the tragedy of the commons. So these are important things, I think, sort of interesting, that here you have an example of how the Indians really did help the environment. Whereas today, I gave the example of uh, a major Indian reservation in Wyoming, where, again, almost entire animal populations have been wiped out by Arapahos who are, run who are riding around on all-terrain vehicles with machine guns and just killing all the animals. Well, whatever happened to their <coughs> mystical union with all living things? Well, it's because... If the, if the understanding is that the animal species are owned by everybody, which is the understanding on that reservation, then th what's the incentive to preserve them for the future? I better just go out and kill what I can right away. So in other words, I have this radical thesis in the book that American Indians were people. They were human beings who responded to incentives and that we should, you know, we should learn something from that and that when people say we need to recapture lost Indian wisdom, how about this Indian wisdom about property rights? Yeah, 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 that'll work. Okay, so anyway, so that's that. Okay, so there's, there's some aspect of, of uh, the economic angle I'm taking here. Now, secondly, I want to say a little bit something about the 1920s. I don't want to dwell too long on this, although something tells me I probably will, uh, because this is kind of same old, same old for some libertarians. But on the other hand, you know, some of you are young people, maybe hearing this for the first time. I mean, I remember 1993, we were out in California, we had the Mises University, I was there for the first time, soaking it all in, and I, I, and I remember just being absolutely blown away and overwhelmed by all, all these great people I was learning from, and I had done all the reading, because I was a geek, I read everything, I read all the, the recommended things, that was back in the days when you had to dig out journal articles in libraries, you couldn't just go to JSTOR and get them online, I had to go around and find them, but that was super fun and great. And as I told people last year, you can see me, if you, if, you, if you look hard, you can see me in the 1993 group photo upstairs. And you can see me, even though it is clearly 1993, I am obviously hanging on to an 80s haircut, just with no direction. I just didn't know where to go with my hair, so I just kept it in that 80s style. Thank goodness I'm married. Who knows what I would look like now. But. Anyway, let me carry on with the 1920s. You've already heard from Professor Garrison tonight about uh, Austrian business cycle theory, which is very important, and I'll probably return to that when I talk about doing economic history, because that's obviously a tool that somebody schooled in the Austrian tradition, but doing history has over his peers in other traditions, because we, we have this understanding of the cycle that can illuminate history for us, uh, certainly better than, than others can. But having, having said that, and, and pointing out that in my book I actually give a kind of a popular, regular guy rendition of the Austrian theory of the cycle, because I figure you know, this, is, this is being pitched to the general public. Most of them don't know anything about the Austrian theory, but it would be great if they did, so I, I point that out. But then I get to our two, favorite, one, two of my favorite presidents, uh, Herbert Hoover and Franklin Roosevelt. That's not really true. That's not really true. Some, people sometimes debate who the best president in American history was. And, we can, we can have that, that argument later. Who the worst ones were is even more fun. But, but, uh, but for now, I want to say, say, just say a little something about Herbert Hoover. Now, it's sort of, I think, now begun to switch back. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the decades following the New Deal, you began to get this consensus that formed among historians that Herbert Hoover was a very hands-off president. He didn't intervene in the economy much, and that was the problem because we all know the free market leads to these downturns and you need to intervene and have some kind of economic management to reverse them. And now it's true that that, in, by professional historians, professional historians would recognize that that's really not accurate, that in fact Hoover was a very interventionist president, that he himself said that as he was leaving office, that we've tried everything. We've been the most activist administration in American history. We've tried everything and nothing has worked. And he draws no conclusions from this and then goes off and, and into retirement. 
and, but then continues being a commentator, of course, because that's what, that's what former presidents do. They don't, they don't ever just stop talking, ever. Keep on going. Can't just be satisfied bathing. No, 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 got to keep talking. But what's interesting to note is that he himself repeatedly said, and it's clear from his record as Commerce Secretary in the 20s, that he was not a supporter of laissez-faire capitalism. And he said this over and over again. And I think, you know, it's, it's, it's a good question why it is that he ever got this reputation as being this big free marketeer. And I think the answer is that he was an opponent of, of the New Deal to some extent. Although he couldn't be a thoroughgoing opponent of the New Deal because so much of the New Deal grew out of his own programs. And FDR's own advisors even said that we pretty much extrapolated from what Hoover had already done and then we, we built up the New Deal. But he, was, he thought the New Deal went too far. Now, we all know that the media and the history establishment is typically very bad at making distinctions like this. So, I mean, like we oftentimes are lumped in with uh, Newt Gingrich or, or even George W. Bush or something, you know, because we're not, we don't favor public ownership of the means of production or something. So we're all basically the same. And so they lump, a lot of, a lot of times they lump people together who are really not the same. Uh, or they make differences. They differentiate between people who are really not so different. And so, Hoover's protests against the New Deal well, earned him this spot in the history books as the great defender of the free market. Well, if they looked more closely, they would see that his was not a root and branch assault on the New Deal. But what's particularly interesting and very often overlooked is that during the 20s, while Hoover was Commerce Secretary, he was helping to promote a way of thinking among businessmen that has sometimes been called associationalism, whereby businessmen would help to regulate themselves and see, this already sounds like a bad idea, right? The idea that, that according to Hoover and according to many business leaders themselves, the days of the unfettered free market are over. We now need to have some kind of sensible planning of our economy, and who better to plan than the businesses themselves? And the argument in the 20s was that what we need to do is have the various industries grouped together in you know, in effect, in various associations, trade associations, and those associations will help to establish what, for example, would be rules of fair competition that everybody in that industry should observe if he doesn't want to be shunned uh, and isolated. So in the 20s, Hoover encouraged this, said this is, this is just what we need. We don't need each business just producing whatever it wants. We certainly can't have chaos like that. We need the various industries to govern themselves and issue rules and regulations for themselves. Now you heard this in all the business magazines. This was the, the very, very mainstream talk throughout the 20s. So for instance, one businessman complained, and that th this is the reason that we need this type of arrangement, that our profits are absolutely unprotected. Oh, poor baby, no. <laughs> Other people can compete with you? Amazing. Now, the, the, um, one of my favorites, though, is this, because it sounds so cutesy until you, you, know, you, you, you apply your sort of cynical nature to it and, and really interpret it. The American bottlers of carbonated beverages declared as follows. My desire shall not be to undersell my fellow bottlers, but to contend with them for first place in the quality of my products and the service I render my patrons. Well, this makes historians swoon. Historians who 99% of the time don't believe a word a businessman says because they're exploiters and wicked and evil and, and selfish. And, you know, the fact is that I do believe, by the way, there are some good businessmen in the world. And I also do believe that some of them, in fact, really take real satisfaction and pleasure in what they do, that no matter how mundane or prosaic the thing is that they produce, I do believe there are people who are kind of like the businessmen you see in Ayn Rand's novels, where they actually... It really means something to them to take part in the, in the creative process. But of course, that would all be condemned as silly romanticism on the part of our historians. However, however, they make one exception. In the 20s, when businessmen talk about cooperating rather than competition, well, all that critical apparatus goes right out the window and historians say, isn't this wonderful? They all just wanted to work together. <laughs> well, of course, what it really means, my desire shall not be to undersell my fellow bottlers. That's a way of saying no one can ever have a sale on carbonated beverages. We're all going to sell it at least this level. Well, that doesn't seem quite so selfless when you put it that way, but that's precisely the way they're putting it here if you look closely enough. So you've got a lot of this type of rhetoric repeated over and over again. But on the other hand, all of this was strictly voluntary for the most part. The government was not really involved. 
other than in perhaps a supervisory role. But John T. Flynn, who was a great journalist who turned a uh, massive opponent of, of uh, Franklin Roosevelt, John T. Flynn pointed out that, you know, at first, organizations like this rely upon a certain spiritual pressure operating through the law of honor to keep people obeying these various rules of competition. But he says, but very soon they begin to seek more effective means of bringing about conformity. Because, for instance, suppose you are an up-and-coming carbonated beverage bottler and you find that you don't want to compete according to the rules of fair competition that the established firms have devised. And typically these rules, as you can, you can read all the details of this in Butler Schaefer's book uh, called In Restraint of Trade. He talks all about this stuff. But obviously these rules are meant to discourage entry into the, into the industry and to give the established firms more of an advantage because they already have name recognition. They already have the trust of the public. They don't need to build those things up so they can continue in the same patterns of competition. It's the new firms that need dynamic means to get the public's attention and to promote their products. Well, some of these means are foreclosed by these rules of fair competition. So you'll always have people violating them. So what's the next step? You're going to have to make it the force of law that you can't, you can't do this. And in fact, under Franklin Roosevelt for a couple of years, that's exactly what happened. What, what Roosevelt typically did was he would take a Hoover program that was bad enough and then just make it a zillion times worse, typically by taking a semi-voluntary thing and making it into something you're going to jail for if you don't do it. And that happened under the National Industrial Recovery Act and the National Recovery Administration of Franklin Roosevelt. Now we also got, and I won't dwell on this uh, too much, but you also got the fact that Franklin, that, uh, pardon me, see, I'm, I'm, it's a slip there. I was going to say Franklin Roosevelt, I mean Herbert Hoover. That's how close they are. Herbert Hoover also was concerned that at, during, as this economic downturn seems to be descending upon the country, or at least he feared that one was in, the, in uh, 29 after the stock market crash, as many of you know, he called in business leaders into the White House in November 1929, had a series of conferences and urged them not to cut wages and if possible to raise wages during the Depression. Now this is a time when prices are falling every year by 15%, 10%, every year and so he wants them to, to, raise, to uh, raise wages at that time. Well, typically you don't want to make the president upset. I mean, this is why you, you, this is why you used to see Bill Gates playing golf with Bill Clinton. You know, you, you know what you have to do to keep people happy. So the, ma the big firms typically did this and some of them even believed it. Some of them believed it in the business magazines. They're all saying, yep, we're doing our job keeping the, the country from falling into depression. We're keeping wages really high. And, you know, some economists at the time tried to point out this is not going to do what you think it's going to do. It's not going to increase purchasing power, which was the, the standard phrase. One economist said, well, an unemployed laborer has no purchasing power at all. And these wages are going to produce an awful lot of those. And so, again, just, just go on, uh, on this, in this vein, much of what Hoover did uh, that on the surface seems like it's aimed towards some other goal is actually aimed toward propping up this this, uh, this high wage policy that he had, and I give a variety of examples of that. We have the fact that he signed into law the Norris LaGuardia Act on behalf of organized labor. Uh, there's a whole ch I have a whole chapter on organized labor. The Reconstruction Finance Corporation makes low interest loans to businesses in trouble and makes loans to the states to fund public works projects. He spends more on public works projects in four years than had been spent in the previous 20. He inaugurates a whole series of, of tax increases and then sits around and just cannot understand why the Depression is just getting worse and worse. But then I, I, I want to just shift in, into the 30s. There's no need to go into Franklin Roosevelt did not get us out of the Depression. Uh, if, if you don't know that, then now you do, and then there are great books you can read on that subject. There's Jim Powell's book, FDR's Folly. There's, there's uh, Tom DiLorenzo's book, How Capitalism Saved America. I've got stuff on it in this. But I just want to say a little bit about Social Security, even though Social Security seems like such a policy wonk thing to talk about, but, but there are a few things that I'd just like to mention before stopping, and then I'll be happy, happy to take uh, questions. Social Security program, of course, starts under Franklin Roosevelt in the 30s, and most people think they understand how it works. Uh, they get taxed over the course of their lives, and then in return, they get a right to receive old age benefits on the basis of what they've paid into the, the program. And the money they pay goes into a trust fund, and they'll draw from this trust fund in their old age. And so the program is really like a private insurance program. And so social security taxes are like, you know, an insurance premium, an insurance premium that you go to jail for not paying. 
they don't just cancel the policy. If it were really an insurance program, just cancel my policy. All right. Well, now, this description has been sold to Americans for 70 years, but it's false in every particular. In 1935, when they first came up with this idea, there was a concern that the, that the Supreme Court would strike it down on the, on the grounds that the Constitution does not give the federal government any authority to establish an insurance program. So they, went, they moved very gingerly. When they worded this, the, the act, they worded the legislation, they went out of their way not to mention insurance. And so there was a benefits thing and a tax thing. But there's no explicit connection between the money you pay in and benefits you receive. So right from the beginning, these things are made separate. Then once it seems like it's passing constitutional muster, then immediately the, the insurance language begins to be used to promote it, even though it's, not, it's, it's, it's strictly speaking not insurance. So you begin hearing, oh, it's just an insurance program, an insurance program, an insurance program. And that's, the reason they keep doing that is that insurance companies actually weathered the Great Depression fairly successfully. And they had pretty good reputations at that time. So the Social Security program could, in effect, uh, use the coattails of insurance, the, the, the good name of insurance, to promote itself. Okay. Now, in fact, uh, by the way, there is a historian of, the, of Social Security who says that lest the Supreme Court take judicial notice of the way officials were trying to sell the program, administrators believed it was imperative to keep the language sufficiently opaque. Well, that's nice to hear, living in a free society. Let's try to word this thing as incomprehensibly as possible. That's, that's nice. Well, now, the president, congressional leaders, spokesmen for the Social Security Administration, they all continue to peddle this thing. Oh, you're just paying insurance premiums and you get a right to receive money in your old age and it's like an annuity and, and this and that. Okay, well then this starts to break down little by little because of some Supreme Court challenges over the years. There was a case, for instance, in 1960 called Fleming versus Nestor, which involved the Bulgarian-born Ephraim Nestor, who was deported from the U.S. in 1956 because of communist activities. And he was denied his Social Security benefits and because they, in 1954 there was an amendment to the, the uh, Social Security Act that said that anybody who was deported for criminal activity uh, would be denied his benefits. Well, Nestor sued and, and argued that all through the history of the Social Security Act, these old age insurance benefits have been referred to as a right of the recipient that he's earned and paid for. Well, in the Supreme Court, here's what the federal government said about Social Security. It's the exact opposite of what they've been telling people. Social Security, according to the federal government under pressure, is in no sense a federally administered insurance program under which each worker pays premiums over the years and acquires at retirement an indefeasible right to receive for life a fixed monthly benefit, irrespective of the conditions which Congress has chosen to impose from time to time. The contribution, in quotation marks they even put, con even they know that's phony, the contribution exacted under the Social Security plan from an employee is a true tax. It is not comparable to a premium under a policy of insurance promising the payment of an annuity commencing at a designated age. So let's see. Uh, Social Security is not an insurance program in which workers pay premiums and possess a right to receive benefits in the future. The Social Security contribution is merely a tax and not comparable to an insurance premium entitling the payer to receive an annuity beginning at a certain age. Uh, it, well, where do people ever get these ideas? Could it be from the federal government's consistent, relentless propaganda for over two decades? But yet, even after the Fleming case, the government continues to peddle the old thing. So again, yes, the, the bathtub was invented in the 1840s by Adam Thompson. People go, oh, okay. But you've just heard that's not true, and they continue to believe it. So, for example, by 1975, one Social Security expert had counted 61 references in literature issued by the Social Security Administration referring to its taxes as contributions, without the quotation marks, and premiums. Now, my favorite uh, uh, anecdote and episode, though, involves what happened with the Amish, because the Amish don't believe in insurance. Their view is that the Amish, we will take care of each other. We don't need any crummy insurance program. So how are we going to get the Amish to participate? Because in 1954, Social Security coverage was extended to self-employed farmers. How are we going to get the Amish to participate in a program they don't want? How will we do that? We'll tell them it's not insurance. Because for them, it's not insurance. Because they can't have it be insurance. So it won't be. So that's, that's what they were told. Social Security officials uh, said to them that the Social Security contribution was merely a tax and not an insurance premium. 
So they, the, in fact, what Social Security Administration officials said to them is, well, would you be willing to pay the tax, but you just don't want to get the benefits? Typical government scam. Yeah. Yeah, that's what we want. So some Amish thought that was really not a satisfactory uh, solution. And they actually came out and said, look, the program, the title of the program is Old Age Survivors and Disability Insurance. So how can you tell us with a straight face this is not insurance? Well, what were they going to do about these, these Amish who normally are not a big problem for the federal government? Well, the answer is, in the case of uh, well, a number of these poor souls, uh, there's, there's one gentleman, uh, uh, Valentine Byler, who, had a, uh, who was in arrears to the Social Security Administration in the amount of $308.96. So, one day, Byler is out plowing, and IRS agents show up at his property, unhitch his horses, and send them away to be auctioned off, all to fund a retirement program the guy doesn't even want or need. In 1965, the federal government finally decided the Amish don't have to pay Social Security. Now, every time Social Security experiences a crisis, we get the same mythology. It's the bathtub, it's Chief Seattle, it's, it's the same thing. We get, for instance, I just quote a few letters in my book, that, that, uh, and I give the citations for them. But, for instance, a letter to the editor in the 1980s, when the mere suggestion that there might be reform provoked massive letter-writing campaigns that I'm sure were not organized by various pressure groups at all. These were spontaneous letters from the heartland. But one letter from the, that appeared in the Detroit Free Press said, where do you get the nerve to insinuate that Social Security recipients are supported by workers? Social Security is an insurance program generously contributed to by workers and by employers. Well, of course, what actually happens in Social Security, is you, as you may know, is you pay the Social Security tax. And that's not going in any fund for you. That's going to pay Mrs. Jones down the street receiving Social Security. That goes to her immediately. If there's anything over and above what the government needs to pay out to current recipients, they'll spend that on current general expenditures. And then they'll throw some treasury bonds that are a special kind of treasury bond that can't be sold in the open market. So they're a very weird kind of asset. They'll throw these things into some lockbox. Who cares? Who would even need to lock the thing? Like, oh, here are some non-sellable treasury bonds. <laughs> That can, that, that can only be, in effect, redeemed by taxing the population. So the whole thing's a scam. All the details are in my book. But, but so of course, that's what's happening, is that workers are paying currently the people who are receiving. So it's very hard to ever do anything about the program, because the current recipients, the, the intelligent ones among them, know that if you allow current workers to opt out, where are they going to get their money from? The current workers are giving them their money. They're not getting it from any, from any lockbox or any, any trust fund. But again, to the Chicago Tribune. Columnists should stop writing about Social Security as if it were social welfare for senior citizens. Where this notion got started, we don't know, but it should be laid to rest once and for all. I mean, it's just like you're living in, I'd like to say you're living in an Orwell novel, but it's too weird for that. When things like this just persist, like things that are obviously provably false just continue to, continue to persist. So it's, it's more like you're living in a Kafka novel, maybe. Maybe that's a better, better analogy. Like you're Gregor Samsa and you wake up and you're a giant bug. Maybe that <laughs> describes things a little bit better. Well, there's much more to be said about the economic angle of the book. There's a whole thing on labor unions in there. Labor unions really aren't as good as you've been led to believe. I've got in there a whole thing about how American labor law works. You, you should have a stiff drink before you read this, if you're ever imagining going into, going into business. I, I point out things like the National Labor Relations Board has officially determined that if striking workers who actually cause damage and even hurt people uh, reapply for employment, you can't refuse to hire them on those grounds alone because sometimes what they were engaged in was maybe just a moment of animal exuberance. <laughs> uh, excused cases of animal exuberance have included beatings, stabbings, <laughs> bombings, threatening of non-strikers' families, destruction of property, blocking ent entrances to struck firms with broken glass and nails, and hurling brickbats. So as Henry George wrote in the 19th century, those who tell you of trade unions bent on raising wages by moral suasion alone are like those who would tell you of tigers that live on oranges. Well, I remember when I was in high school, my view was that if it hadn't been for labor unions, again, right now I'd be in a mine somewhere, you know, probably dead, 
you know, with one limb. I got to have the indignity of dying with just one limb remaining to me. I had all this stuff drilled into my head. I couldn't imagine anyone getting out of school with any other way of thinking. That thank goodness for the government. And then you make the magic, amazing discovery, who runs the schools? <laughs> the very people who are portrayed in our school books as the saviors and suddenly it clicks so in effect I basically have written a couple of books that will never be assigned by anybody <laughs> but the one consolation was when I used to have to assign textbooks in when I would teach uh, American history uh, courses um, I would always be depressed oh I got you know I was never happy with any book I ever assigned but then I remembered one thing most, I include, present company accepted, most college students today don't read anyway. <laughs> All right, thank you, thank you very much. Okay. Okay, I'll take, we'll take one question, because we, we have just, just a minute, but then I know we're all exhausted and, and, and hot, and so we, what, we, what we're dying to do is, is to retire to the muggy, brutal heat outside where we can drink and we won't care about the temperature. <laughs> all right, uh, yes? Ah, ha! Yeah, the question is, can we create our own urban legend about Austrian economics and see if we can perpetuate that one? I don't I, I just don't think it works the other way around. It only works. You're going against the grain, I think. All right, thank thank you all very much.